Valdez, CEO of the American Society on Aging. And I want to welcome you to Friday at Generations Forum. What a terrific week we've had. Thank you everyone for joining. I was really impressed with all your engagement, the content, and overall what we learned. You know, the digital divide is still vast and it remains so for a variety of reasons. There are some really tough questions and challenges that remain. For example, how can we provide the internet to those who still need it most from broadband coverage to ensuring we get out devices that people need? How can we make sure that telehealth doesn't exacerbate health disparities if it's unequally available? What will state and federal governments actually be able to do to support access to the internet and affordability? And we know the ROI of designing tech universally and with older adults so how can we encourage more of it while reducing ageism? And how much technology do we really need? We also heard about creative partnerships and models that are not only innovative, but also really effective. In our chats throughout the week, we heard from you about state assistive technology programs offering device loans, funds through CMS for connective technology in nursing homes, and about programs like Well-Connected Espanol, Covia, Oasis Connections, and Arts Philadelphia. We learned about the important work of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, the Computer and Communications Industry Association, and the Consumer Technology Association Foundation. And yesterday, we heard about innovations in measuring and addressing the digital divide happening across the globe from Germany, Japan, and Israel. Today, we're going to, to look to the future at the short term and what possibilities might lie in the long term. I want to thank Gina Beck, ASA board member and senior care strategist at CDW, and thanking CDW for sponsoring this week's event. And now I'd like to present our closing act, a good friend and inspiring voice for technology, Tom Camber, the executive director of OATS. Tom? It's an honor to be doing this, and I have to say, I started OATS in 2004, and for the, over the years, I've come to the ASA meetings and conventions, and it's been a place where every year I learn something new. I meet people that help me rethink what I'm doing, and it's really exciting to see this year all the changes that are afoot and see how much technology has been brought into the equation and also see the focus on equity, which I think is really important to a lot of us. And I know people are um, feeling really motivated and kind of... Uh, juiced up about what's gonna come next. So I, I'm, I'm super happy to see the growth and membership that's taking place and uh, just people really being, being involved. And just very briefly, the reason that I was excited when Peter asked me to do this is uh, I run a nonprofit organization that's, that uses technology to help older people change the way they age. And for years, we've been the practitioners. We were always down in the trenches working with you know tenants associations and senior centers and libraries and um, teaching people how to get the photographs off their phones and how to get signed up for Gmail. And then originally it was Yahoo. We taught Yahoo in the beginning and then we switched to Gmail. Um, and so we've been evolving along with the technology. But I spend a lot of time looking at things like, um, you know, what's the best uh, way to teach entrepreneurship with a technology class and which um, tool should we use for people to do for budgeting? And so we're really, really kind of, you know, in the details. But as we do this, we're always hearing people talk about what they always refer to as the, 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 um, the whole new world that's unfolding for them. And they always say this, I'll, I'll be working with someone and she'll look at me and say, it feels like a whole new world. And you can kind of just toss that off and not think about it, but you can also realize that what's really exciting for many people when they deal with technology and older people especially is the sense that we remember, you know, before a lot of this technology was so popular and people are activating their imaginations about what could be possible uh, in, in the long run. And so I'm gonna do a presentation today that really um, grapples with these big picture topics. It's the first time I've done it. So bear with me if I veer off course or go you know, off on some strange tangent. But um, these are ideas that I've been taking notes on for years and I just wanna help uh, people kind of explore them. And rather than start at the beginning in terms of what we're gonna do now, I wanna start 
at the long picture, the long view of where we're trying to go, and then back up to the present so that we can all end with what we can do now. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Let's see if I can get that to work. Hold on a second. And uh, whoops, one second. Screen share is not here somewhere. There. All right, I'm going to do a brief PowerPoint and then I'm going to turn that off because I'm, I'm not only a PowerPoint guy. You should be able to see a PowerPoint that is now on your screen. On your screen. That's, you're nodding, that's good. Uh, and I'm going to get it started. All right, so the presentation is the future of, age, of aging. And as I mentioned, we're going backwards. So we'll start out with what's possible. Think about technology for a minute. And I want to present this as an optimist's view. Um, it turns out there are uh, societies around the United States that I discovered recently called optimist societies. I don't know if many of you have seen them or ever heard of them, but they were founded in the early 20th century and all across America, there are still optimist societies of people who work primarily with young people and think about optimism. I do want to say when we talk about tech and, and as, as activists, which I, I assume almost all of us are here, we're often grappling with the negativity of who's not online or, or why is the technology not doing what it's supposed to do or how do we grapple with um, you know, uh, some of the social negatives around racism or poverty. And I'm aware of all of those challenges. We deal with them every single day. But my job today is to be an optimist and to let that part of this conversation emerge a little bit. So we're going to talk about the optimist view on technology. I want people to imagine with me, just kind of clear your head for a moment and imagine a world where there is no digital divide, where all older adults are online, where everybody interacts seamlessly with their devices. None of this dropped calls or we can't figure out how to get the technology to work or, you know, something is, is uh, uh, you know, too big for a file or something like that. But everybody is really working uh, comfortably with devices the same way they might with, a, say, a toothbrush or a kitchen knife. And technology in this world is at the service of older people. So it's not a world where older people can't get online and are at war with technology or where there's a big gap for uh, what people have referred to at times as the elder gap, but rather we're in a world here where technology helps people who are aging with their lives and to live better and to improve their communities. We asked this question recently in preparation for this seminar. Um, at Senior Planet, we put out a, a, a call for comments for people. And in under a week, we got 300 written responses. It was amazing. People wrote back all sorts of great ideas and they were full of visionary concepts. So I wanna try to honor those responses with some of the themes today and package them together. A lot of the information I'm gonna to present today comes from people's feedback. Secondly, we asked three experts who I'm calling brainiacs in the field. And they are Richard Adler, who has, is in the, at the Institute for the Future, um, but also has been really active in the Santa Clara, Santa Clara County um, uh, Age Friendly Program and, and, and helping uh, focus on broadband and technology in, in California. But Richard goes back and was a, a founding member of an organization called SeniorNet, which was pioneering in the 1980s before the internet really before uh, the web was created, they were teaching older adults to how to get online. So I interviewed Richard, Richard about what he thought, uh, where things were going. I wanted to talk to somebody with a focus in healthcare and I spoke with Karina Edwards who runs Quill Health, she's the CEO. And Quill Health is a relatively new organization that's marrying uh, a really interesting digital framework for people to do a healthcare journey support to technologies like Comcast cable systems or um, uh, uh, health providers out of Philadelphia. So she's really at the front lines in terms of what's possible with home monitoring devices and people act, um, handling transitions in and out of hospitals. And then I spoke briefly with Ruth Finkelstein also, who is at Hunter College, and she was a, um, essentially invented age-friendly New York and was really a pioneer in New York for helping people think about the future of aging. And then finally, I went into the OATS data systems. OATS collects a lot of data and we've been commissioning research on technology use and, and access for 
several years now. This is simply a table that happened to be on my computer yesterday. So I thought I would share with you the kind of data that we're looking at. And we have all sorts of data around who is online, um, what kinds of patterns we're experiencing. So for example, this particular chart calls out that the, the largest number of people who are not online are people with less than a high school education. Uh, and people that are very low income also fall into the non-broadband uh, subscribing group. And so we're learning a lot about who's online and what, they, what they're doing. So what I'm going to do over the next half an hour is, or a little bit less than half an hour, is give three parts to this answer. One is the long view, where we're going in terms of really large picture, um, pie in the sky kind of vision, visionary ideas. And I'm talking about things in that section, the first part, of, first part of what I'm going to talk about, that might be 20 years into the future or even 30 years into the future, maybe beyond uh, some of the lifespans of people that, that are here or myself, but, but we can imagine them happening and it's a real futurist uh, idea, you know, session here. The middle part, uh, the second section is really what I'm calling the mid game. These are changes that we can imagine happening within the next 10 to 20 years that we can imagine seeing and making happen and being part of the change that, that achieves these, these changes, uh, the advocacy. And then the third section is really, what do we do about it? Where do we get started? So that is my framework. Uh, this is not the end of the presentation. I'm gonna just simply stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna get an appropriate Zoom background so that we can all have the right mood. There we go, the Jetsons, okay. People do know the Jetsons, right? You saw the Jetsons? I'm not the only person? Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's get started with the content part of this. So let's look at the really big picture items here. When I was in, uh, I, I did a, a research trip recently, where, or a couple of years ago, where I traveled around the, the world. I got to visit eight different countries and explore what they were doing around technology. And I spent quite a bit of time in Asia. And one of the things that really made, uh, inspired me at the time was the, uh, the notion that we are moving toward a world where in the long, in the long run, we may achieve a moment, a, a period where our social connections are truly global. Where somebody who lives in San Antonio could be friends with somebody who lives in Osaka and they share a passion for, you know, um, flower arranging and they found each other through some kind of collaborative filtering or other kind of system that, that allows them to connect and that we have a technology that allows people who don't speak each other's languages to speak in real time and have it translated for the other person. That technology is almost upon us right now, the idea that we can speak across language barriers and the idea that we can use it across geographies and make a friend and share that friendship with somebody as if they live down the street from us opens up the possibility for overcoming the social isolation that is related to people's geography and their uh, ability or inability to travel. I was in a session in Washington, D.C. Um, about seven or eight years ago where a woman graduated from our tablet class with her iPad and she said, I always wanted to travel and I never had the money to do it. But she held up her iPad and she said, but I've been to Africa now. And she was really feeling that connection. And so imagine a world where your friends, you might have a few friends that are local, which is great. You need the human touch of people there, but you might also have friends all over the world that share an interest. It could be a sports interest or a musical interest or just a personal connection, but people emerge that way. So that's, I think, very possible after the digital divide when a lot of people are online and they're using the technology comfortably. When we talk about people's health and their fitness levels and how people live well, um, there's really an opportunity for a change in how medical science is keeping us healthy. And this is getting into those things like nanotechnologies and biotech and the sort of future of, of, of physical uh, uh, care. And the concept that I think has, that many of the people on this session, I'm sure have heard of this idea, but the concept that really inspires me here is what they call compression of morbidity. And compression of morbidity is the idea that we are really quite healthy up to a very late point in our lives. We take advantage of, you know, medical treatments and hip replacements and uh, fitness regimens and things. And then we reach a certain point where human bodies kind of reach the natural lifespan that we have. And then we get sick and die very quickly. So the morbidity part of our lives is compressed into a very small portion at the very end of our lives. And we live much more healthy than we than prior generations. That idea is 
certainly possible and could even be more reachable than people may imagine in the in the near future, uh, but definitely seems to be uh, a real potential future for older adults in a post uh, digital divide world. Third, there is an opportunity here where there may be an, uh, a, a period of our lives in which we reach a kind of post scarcity time where AI and robotics and the, the, uh, the global supply chain have man managed to create enough food and enough basic uh, goods and services for people that people live pretty well and the, work, the working week has shrunk to 20 hours or something like that for people. There used to be a lot of writing about this notion of the end of work and, and the, the society where leisure is, is possible. But imagine a society like that 50 years from now where efficiencies and economic changes have made it possible for older people not to have to worry about whether or not they can support themselves at a decent standard of living because there's so much wealth that's been created and reinvested that we're simply living at higher rates of, of, of uh, standards of living. There's an interesting book by a guy named uh, Steven Pinker called The um, uh, Enlightenment Now that makes this similar case around the pro progression of uh, economic capacity. And while we're all so um, caught up in the negativity of the poverty and the dislocation and the inequality that exists today, sometimes it's, it's worth stepping back and trying to recognize that um, extreme poverty across the globe has, has plummeted in the last 40 years. And the rates of economic development have increased with productivity and things like that. So those will affect the quality of life for older people in the future. Um, smart cities and smart communities is a topic that comes up a lot on the conference circle, circuit. And it's usually really primitive. When we look at what people are talking about, they're imagining more the idea that, um, you know, in a smart city, they might have uh, the ability to turn off uh, traffic, traffic signals when an ambulance is going to the hospital, which is really great. I mean, that's a very important thing. But I, I'm imagining something a lot more ambitious with smart cities. For example, I met a guy in Israel last year who has a, a service where they have an app that allows volunteers in real time, wherever they are in the city, to find an older person who might need a friendly visit or an errand run or somebody to help them out with something. And the volunteer has already been pre-screened. Uh, they're part of a corporate um, system that, that for companies that are sponsoring this. And they can simply be matched up with an older adult in real time. And that connection can take place almost instantaneously. And the person can stop off in their hour after lunch that they happen to have that day, go help the person and be providing that kind of hands-on service that people really need. Imagine a future in which that's commonplace and in which cities employ the capacity of volunteers in a much more robust and ambitious way. We aren't, we aren't anywhere near that yet, but the technology already exists to start making these things happen. Two other, three other really important things for the future, this kind of pie in the sky future. One of them is um, the notion of purpose and purpose-driven lives. We have, uh, at the moment, we're at probably a low point in the arc, hopefully a low point in the arc of trust amongst people that are engaged in civic participation, where people uh, don't, you know, there, there's a question about how to, how to handle misinformation and fraud and election hacking. But imagine a future in which these things slowly get better. And imagine an opportunity where people start using the technology to deliver their own support. I was on the phone actually this morning with the president of the ARP Foundation, uh, Lisa Marsh, Marsh Ryerson. Do you know they have 40,000 volunteers that, that volunteer at ARP right now? 40,000. Nobody talks about this. Nobody's saying like this purpose that people are, are bringing to the table. There, there is so much passion amongst older people to make the world a better place. They're providing tutoring for kids. They have thousands, I think they have 3,000 older adults who are tutoring young people and reading. And yet as a society, we don't capture a lot of that energy or make it as widespread as we can because people have sort of lost track of how to use the technology as a civic engagement tool. So a post-digital divide uh, world is one where I think there's a real opportunity for that kind of social change. And then a, a really important, the last two points. One is um, there's a giant, gigantic gender gap in aging. And I'm sure a lot of people are aware of this uh, who work on the ground in, in, in organizations. But if you walk into a senior center, you're often going to look around and realize that most people are women that take advantage of programs and services. And I did a little research a while ago and found that there is a, about two thirds of the, of the women over the age of 65 are single and un, unmarried and, and not in a, in a relationship in their homes. Many of them live alone. And for the male 
portion of that population over 65, it's the opposite. About two thirds of them are in a, a committed relationship at home. And what that means is the, the burden of isolation and loneliness is primarily falling on women, almost twice as much as it is on men. And you can imagine a society in the future where we start to rethink some of these relationship and gender dynamics and handle them in really creative and different ways. Um, I can't tell you what exactly that looks like, but I can say that uh, the, a future in which technology is really enabling us to overcome social barriers and rethink how we do things and how we connect with each other, rethink how our bodies are evolving and our fitness levels and, and what, what beauty looks like, um, enable people to be anonymous in their interactions or have visual screens that allow them to look however they want to look. These kinds of things are going to open up a lot of change for people's social relationships. And one of the things I hear about a lot from the people that we work with is, you know, what's going on with genders and gender and partnerships and, and how do we handle that? What does it look like? And the last thing I want to raise is something I, I, I spoke to, uh, I was talking to Ruth, Fink, Ruth Finkelstein about this, and this is something that she's really drawn to my attention. Aging as an experience is something that goes a lot better if we start handling its dynamics when we're a lot younger. And that goes primarily for things like education, inequality, physical health and healthcare, uh, and economic security starting earlier in our lives. It's very difficult to come onto the playing field when you're 75 and try to start solving all of these problems. But when technology allows us to get at things earlier and help people become more educated, help people have better healthcare when they're younger, those characteristics in our younger years are the strongest predictors of our quality of life in our older years. So one of the dynamics I think that's really important for the future of aging is to, to think about how technology can allow us to link our activity when we're younger to our expectations when we're older. And as older people help craft a world where younger people are actually preparing for their own aging when they're 20 and 30 and 40, because we all know that that's what's gonna to lead to a better world for all of us. All right, that's my Jetsons very long-term picture. I'm gonna back up to the medium picture, take about five minutes for this, ready? Medium picture is, first of all, the nature of work is changing very dramatically. And technology is allowing people to work longer and work from home in more flexible ways. The working longer part of it is clear in the sense that a lot of older adults want to stay in the workforce longer with their age retirement, at least potentially voluntarily has gone, has gone up. And if we can overcome the digital divide for people, they don't get pushed out of the workplace as quickly. So older people can be more, can earn more income, but their productivity goes back into our economic output for the country, which we need. So when America has a need for economic productivity and we're asking who's going to pay all these taxes to support the, the expenditures that we have and how are we building a better economy, a lot of it comes from the idea of how do we make sure that people who want to work can work and can work as long as they'd like to. So the, the future of work for people being able to use tech, learn the technology skills around the office, learn how to use tech as a strategic element for decision making really opens up a lot of economic opportunities for people. And the twin um, pillar of that is, is entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is a, a, you know, already clear that a lot of older adults are driving the entrepreneurship um, developments in the United States. But one of the things that's really important that I want to call to people's attention to is we really lack programs that promote entrepreneurship for older adults in lower income communities. And that's an area where we've been observing it a lot at OATS and our, our data is showing the same outcomes. Seniors in minority communities and housing developments and lower, lower income uh, rural areas really need to be able to use entrepreneurship, one, as a way of earning money and also contributing to local economies. We don't have a lot of programs set up for senior entrepreneurs. And that's something that I think we could really uh, see a big difference if it happened. Second big idea here is uh, robotics. And Robotics is, I think, an idea that we, we, we have oversold to some degree. Uh, we tend to think it's you know, um, gonna solve all of our problems and, and, and address the problem. We just don't have enough people to take care of folks in nursing homes. That's not actually the true scope of the story here. A lot of robotics, uh, the robotics of the future is already here to, to a large degree. The, uh, there, there are exoskeleton robots that some of you may have seen that allow people to pick up heavy weights. It's basically just a, a little uh, outfit that you put on that allows you to, to lean over and get up and do things. And that form of robotics is a way that uh, has been used. I visited a robotics laboratory in Japan 
they use the exoskeleton robots for caregivers. The idea being the caregiver can pick up an older person and move them out of their bed into a chair. But I'm thinking that the robotics have a future in the older person themselves getting to wear the outfit and getting up and being able to move around and, and handle things for themselves that they might not be able to do without them. It's, it's almost the extension of the notion, notion of, a, of a prosthesis, a prosthetic arm or leg, but it's a prosthetic exoskeleton that you just put on and it gets up and you can move around the house. And that device is not too far away from being usable at this stage. In fact, they've demonstrated them at, at the Consumer Electronics Show where Steve Ewell, who we were just talking about earlier, was, is one of the, the sponsors there. Um, a second very important element in robotics is um, telepresence, which I don't remember hearing anybody talk about yet in the earlier sessions. Telepresence is simply the notion that you can look into a screen the way that we are, and you can project your image onto a screen somewhere else, which is partly what I'm doing here. But telepresence includes the ability to move that screen around. So it's basically, imagine a, a little robotic cart that you can drive around with a, a kind of a stick on it. And at the top of the stick, there's an iPad. That's telepresence. And telepresence robots exist already. We have several of them at our center in Manhattan at the Senior Planet Center. And I was talking to a woman who was in a hospice bed about five years ago in Connecticut. And I asked her what she wanted, what was going on in her life. And she said, I'm really bent out of shape because I wanted to go see the Whitney Museum um, uh, exhibit of portraits because she knew some of the painters. She was herself a painter, but she couldn't get there. And she really couldn't get out of the bed and couldn't get there. There's no way we could get her to go see the Whitney. And I said, I think I have an idea for you. Would you be willing to drive a telepresence robot around the museum? And she said, sure. And so we got her uh, hooked up with a telepresence robot. The museum agreed to let us do this on their, the day that they're closed. And they have uh, special groups that come through for tours. And I was there, she drove that robot around with a docent for two hours. And she saw every, every picture, because you can drive the robot up to the picture and look at the painting, and then you can turn and speak to people on the screen and they can interact with you. So it's kind of like being in the space. And at the end of the day, she drove the robot to the window of the museum, which looks out over the Hudson River, is about five o'clock, and she watched the sun go down with the robot. And I remember standing there watching that thinking, there's a future here for aging where people can be somewhere using a robot and controlling what the robot does and sees. And there were youth groups in the museum and, and she drove the robot up to their youth and they talked to her through the screen and she told them that she knew who Jean-Michel Basquiat was and it was kind of amazing. And I have this sense in my brain of a future of robotic uh, telepresence where you could have a telepresence, a, a bank of them that would be at a sports stadium and seniors could just, you know, or people with disabilities could check one out and drive it around during the game and watch and, and cheer and, and talk to people. And there's a real future for robotics in that sense where it allows older people to be places that they can't physically be right now or to do things that they wouldn't typically be able to do in, uh, in the present. But there's, you know, the technology is certainly achievable for this. Um, another couple of quick areas that I think I want to call, call to attention. One is this notion of patient activated health. Uh, there's a, um, a long history of trying to move toward patient centered health at homes. I remember there was a guy from Intel named Eric Dishman that I'm sure some of the people on this call have seen. And Eric Dishman had this idea that healthcare used to be kind of like a mainframe computer. It was like one big blocky thing and you had to go there to use it and it was difficult to use and everybody else, it was never under your control. And that as we started to go toward the kind of PC or the home, the wearables and these, these, these mobile devices, healthcare was starting to look more and more like that where we could take it home and use it at home. And in fact, with telehealth, because of COVID, it's now becoming widespread and, and, there are, and reimbursements are happening. And so this sort of patient controlled healthcare environment, which is your home, with devices that allow people to do biometric inputs is starting to really emerge as commonplace. I would encourage people to look at, if you haven't seen it, there's a wonderful tool called the Patient Activation Measure, which is a, a survey that people do of patients in the healthcare system to ask things like, do you know what each of your medications does? And would you be willing to ask your doctor, do you feel comfortable asking a question of your doctor when your doctor, um, uh, it, who, who, you know, that, that might challenge something that he's saying? Um, and it's really a way of getting people to think about becoming more active uh, users of healthcare. And there's really strong um, evidence that activative patients are more healthy. 
And the technology allows us to, to increase patient literacy and create, um, increase the patient's access to data and to their own data. And so a future in which we're using more tele telehealth at home and some of these uh, healthcare devices is a future in which patient activation might really, that's something we could imagine happening in the next 10 or 15 years. And is it a trend that's happening that we're, that we're part of today? So I think that's a, a, a key area in the, in the growth of technology. A um, couple other areas. The smart home is a very important element that we are rapidly approaching. And uh, I spoke to, to um, uh, Karina about this at Quill. We're in a moment now where everybody's starting to see the smart home happening, right? We've got the, you know, the smart doorbells and, and people are using Alexa and, and, and we're starting to get somewhere with, with these devices becoming mainstream. Imagine, however, we have to overcome a few things. We have to make sure that these are trusted devices. We have to make sure they work well, that they're affordable. And we have to make sure that when we start moving toward a scenario where there are sensors that allow people to be tracked and see if they're safe at home, those sensors are not seen as surveillance or disempowerment, but rather we're able to subscribe to some kind of monitoring systems at home that the older adult feels services that person and makes sure that they're the one that's in the driver's seat and they're the one that's in control. We're just one generation away from having that set up. The technology is already there, but so far there's been this kind of standoff on the technology where older people are still not trusting a lot of the smart home devices because correctly, they're a little bit suspicious that these are not set up with an ironclad uh, guarantee that the person at home is able to, to really take advantage of the, those things and be in, empowered. I think the last point I would make on this is just simply that uh, we've got an opportunity here for uh, global travel that we have not necessarily dipped into entirely uh, once the pandemic is over and things start to settle down. Uh, there are incredible opportunities for people to learn and control uh, their travel experiences as they go around the world and learn about different places and get sort of concierge level travel support. That's something I see popping up a lot in the different technology conversations we're having about the future. I'm going to fast forward briefly here to talk about how to get there. This is the third section of my talk and I'm going to take off my Jetson video because this is the part where we talk about just being in reality here. So back to my back to my office. Uh, so how do we get there? One is we have, to, we have to solve the connectivity crisis for older people. There are our data, which we're about to release as a, a report that's coming out in January. We just did a very comprehensive survey, about 21.8 million older adults that do not have a, a wireline internet at home right now, which is close to half of the, the older adults in America. And so when we're over 45% of the people who can't use broadband at home and don't have reliable connections, we have a connectivity crisis. So there's an advocacy need there are two parts to the puzzle here. One is there's an advocacy need to get out there and push for local, state, and federal entities to treat the older adult uh, technology gap as sort of a civic emergency and ask ourselves, what do we need to do in order to close the technology gap so that senior citizens across America are all online the way that we would, if we would be very concerned if people couldn't get access to hot water or electricity, Broadband for people is starting to look like that. It doesn't have to be gigabit, gigabit for everybody. There are opportunities to do it at somewhat lower speeds, especially in rural areas and with 5G rolling out. There's a lot to talk about on this. I'm sure we've already talked about it some this week. But there's an opportunity for advocacy to say, how do we make sure that, you know, there's a couple of obvious solutions. One is um, the federal government can start uh, subsidizing internet access for low-income people. There's a program called Lifeline that has been available for uh, telephone service that could be widely expanded for low-income people to be able to get online, but it's not set up that way because of the regulatory structure. There's no obvious reason why that can't be fixed, and a lot of the advocates at NDIA and other places have been talking about it. There is an opportunity you can imagine for short-term subsidies, the way they do in South Korea, where they actually write a check to telecoms companies that serve low-income people and give them a chance to get online. And then there's a regulatory strategy where the government and partners like everybody at ASA can help connect with local telecommunications companies and say, how can we work together to bring people online that are in vulnerable communities or vulnerable situations and create lower cost offerings for them, which many companies already do. AT&T, T-Mobile, Comcast, uh, Spectrum, they all have offerings in this, in this area, but they haven't been really actively engaged with older people or their advocates. I can tell you, because I work with them, it's been all about the homework gap and not about the older adults gap. 
And I'm all for getting kids online and I absolutely think they should be doing that. It is a priority, but the level of attention to the seniors is about 5% of what it is to everybody else right now. And that's an area where we need to work together. Um, very practically, very specifically, OATS actually has a program now. It's one of the reasons it's a good, good conversation to be having here where we're calling on people to join with us in a campaign called Aging Connected. We have uh, Humana who has made a major commitment to this this year. We talked them into writing a check for $3 million to support a whole year's worth of campaigning around getting older adults online in 2021. Uh, the president of Humana, Bruce Broussard, is involved. He's been uh, on our Zoom classes with seniors doing early morning stretch routines and things like that. Um, but we've got their communications people and their, their, um, uh, their foundation people really helping out with this. If you go to oats.org, and we're going to put this up in the chat as a, uh, a link, oats.org slash join, you'll see a thing called Aging Connected. And that allows everyone who runs a nonprofit or is active in a nonprofit or wants to participate can simply fill that form out, give us your email address, and we're going to be running events every single month over the next 12 months to help close the technology gap for older people. We really need the partnerships of all of the nonprofits because the senior network, the people that serve older adults around the country, is the network that has access to the people who, um, who we're trying to reach. The folks that are not online are disproportionately the people that are coming into senior centers and libraries and housing developments and healthcare organizations, and you know who they are and where they are, and we can give the training and the materials and the support to help people get other people online. So we're ready to provide our side of the partnership there. Somebody actually is just, just dropped a chat up here about AARP and I've been speaking to them. AARP will be working with us on this project next year. They've already said that. So they're a partner. Uh, we have telecommunications companies. Comcast is a partner. T-Mobile is a partner. So there's active interest in, in closing this gap. And we want you to be our partners in doing that. So that's my the future of aging moving backwards from the Jetsons to you know, telepresence robots in uh, sports stadiums and healthcare, and then backing up to talking about how we can get people access to the kinds of technology they need right now to get online. I'll stop here because I know Peter has some questions and so do people in the chat, um, but I'm always happy to talk to people afterwards as well uh, because it's a, such an exciting topic and you guys are the most important people in the world right now. So bring it on. Tom, thank you very much for that optimistic view. Uh, you're absolutely right. The chat has uh, been flooded with questions. I've been collecting them and I'm gonna try and, and interject them uh, into our last 15 minutes that we have with you. Um, but first I wanna pick, pick up where you left off, which is about the digital divide. Uh, you talked about it in terms of uh, older, younger divide. You talked about it in terms of who can afford the internet and those who cannot. I think we should also talk about it in terms of a geographical digital divide, rural and urban. You touched a little bit on this. I know you've done work in this space. Can you just sort of talk specifically about how uh, you're trying to bridge that divide as well? Absolutely. There's a uh, rural, um, rural America lacks internet, internet access. There's a, a, a real problem with accessibility out there. Um, and as some of the states, New York specifically, but others are, are now pushing uh, to build more connection to rural communities, small towns and places that don't get good internet uh, connectivity right now. I will say uh, they just passed legislation at the federal level to promote more broadband uh, infrastructure. I think it's called, I'm going to blank on the name of it, so I won't even try it, but it's, up, it's out there. Uh, and that, that was recently passed. So there will be more build outs. But at the same time, we need to connect older adults to those networks. So OATS has been working in upstate New York and in, in uh, Colorado, particularly on work uh, with rural communities to help provide rural training. We're actually piloting right now an initiative where we're going to train only rural organizations to represent their counties in the senior planet universe. And once somebody gets trained up to deliver the trainings, we're going to license all of our rural curriculum and tech curriculum to that county uh, for a full year. And it's, we're coming up with some price points. It's not free, but we're going to make it affordable enough. We want to reach all 1,889 rural counties in America and make sure that everybody out there has access to quality training and quality support when they can get online. And there's, you know, 5G is going to help to some degree. The satellite systems are improving. But what's really exciting about this thing for, on the rural side, Peter, is that America, the divide in America on the civic side, where people are just having a lot a breakdown in trust in a sense that of of, of, of disconnect between the urban and rural environments. In America right now, that divide is 
partly pivoting on a technology access question. And so we believe that older adults and working to connect older people um, across the urban rural gap there is an opportunity to bring people together in a really profound way. And we had an event not too long ago where um, we brought, we were doing an advocacy uh, event in Albany in New York State to push for rural investment in upstate New York for these very low density communities, mostly agricultural areas. And we put out a call and people all over New York City called up and said that they wanted to go to the rural advocacy event. And I said, but you live in Queens, you know, you live in a housing, you know, building with, you know, 600 people. And, and a woman actually grabbed me at one of the events and said, it's about time that people from New York City went upstate and advocated for people in rural communities. And I was just bowled over by that. I thought, what a great opportunity to bring together people who normally wouldn't see each other. And they spent the whole day up there doing the meetings with the, the, the state assembly people and the, the lunch and the, the teaching. And it was really powerful. And I think there's a real opportunity here. Speaking of opportunity, just a really quick question with respect to your initiative. Uh, can local government entities get involved? Absolutely. Uh, local government entities play a major role in coordinating the, uh, the delivery of telecommunication services. So uh, the easiest way to find out kind of what's possible out there is to connect with uh, a group called NATOA, N-A-T-O-A, which stands for the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors. And NATOA is the kind of professional association that helps local governments do technology planning and policy and advocacy. I've been to their conferences a few times. Their president is a guy uh, that works in the San, San Francisco government uh, and is really active on technology uh, opportunities for local communities and is really interested in working with older adults and the organizations that represent them. So uh, finding ways to create, you know, a lot of it is funding for programming. It's uh, technology access for anchor institutions like senior centers or libraries. Uh, and it can also be, dialoguing about things like rights of way or poll access as they build out the internet connectivity for different communities, the local governments shape who gets that, those opportunities and how they roll out. It can get super wonky, but it's actually really interesting. It's the meat and potatoes of policy. So there's really an opportunity there. Uh, Neto has got great resources for people to look for and uh, to, to connect to, and you can really become activated. And I'm at all the conferences. You can come talk to me anyways. Uh, Tom, you know, you talk about advocacy. Uh, ASA earlier this week at, the, at, at, our, at this forum talked about the need for a variety of, of pieces of legislation that would bridge the digital divide, provide greater access, greater affordability. Know that ASA uh, is going to be a partner of yours as we advocate for more policies, both at the federal, state, and local level. So we're excited to be part of this conversation and to also drive change. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about another topic that came up during the chats. And that is this notion, you mentioned it in terms of opportunity and purpose. Um, you talked a lot about entrepreneurship and how uh, you offer some training. Could you, give you, could you give us some more examples? How is it funded? Could it be funded through things like micro lending programs that happen in the global development context, particularly for low income uh, older adults? What are, what are some resources? Sure, I think that it's, Entrepreneurship is, is an area where that's just sort of ripe for activism. I, I learned a lot about it from connecting with Aging 2.0, uh, which is a network out there that does a lot of focus on innovation and aging. And I discovered that a lot of the people that are innovating and being entrepreneurs in, in, the, in the field are themselves older people. And we were, we had a kind of a mismatch at Oats for years where we were delivering workforce training for people, but they were starting businesses. And we recognized that we needed to retool it so we went to a local bank. This is an interesting option for funding, by the way. We went to City uh, Citigroup, and they have a headquarters in Brooklyn, in Queens, rather. And we we interviewed um, seniors in their community and said, "What do people want?" And about 20 to 25 percent of the people we talked to were interested in economic development, entrepreneurship opportunities, and we got them to commit $250,000 to support a financial security initiative for older people in their community. And this is where it got interesting on the funding start side. They used um, a, uh, a program that is designed for um, overcoming redlining, uh, which was the, the, the they, they call them uh, CRA credits, Community Reinvest Reinvestment Act. And it was very unusual for people to ask for Community Reinvestment Act credits for seniors, 
because it was always used for things like housing or economic development programs. But there's no reason that programs that support older adults doing technology training can't access CRA money. And they applied for the credits, they got their credits, they used them to support our program. We created a 10 week uh, course called, um, uh, called Startup, which is amazing and has all sorts of cool ways for people to use technology when they start businesses. And dozens of seniors have been starting or supporting their businesses out of Senior Planet in New York City. We actually created an incubator in uh, Denver at, at, the, um, uh, at our, our Denver center there at the Lowry base. And that has a physical incubator when we can all go back to the space where people can come start businesses using that technology. Those are all really great examples. I know others in the chat have been posting other helpful links. Please feel free to share your ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tom, I'm gonna end our chat uh, with you on, on one, I think, really important question. You referenced it a few times, uh, and that's trust. Uh, in the context of, of our conversations this week, uh, Microsoft talked about privacy and security. You talked about trust in the context of a smart home. Uh, I know that trust needs to be built fundamentally for older adults to sort of adopt technology and to take advantage of all its opportunities. You know, without going into trust in the civic sense, how can we do a better job, whether it's companies, nonprofits, or, or governments, to really build that sense of trust in an optimistic uh, technological future? I think it comes from a few places. First of all, I think that nonprofits are the first line of defense or attack, depending on which side you look at it from, around um, addressing the needs that older people have in communities. And if we have a, a commitment to excellence and a commitment to serving people, and we use things like design thinking as the models for developing programs, which involve working closely with people as we make programs, and then also asking questions about people's feedback. So they get built back into our own program delivery and make sure that we're uh, able to deliver really effective initiatives. I think our trust is improved with our customers when we treat them like the most important people in the world. And I know that people really do it, but to codify it, to measure it, we actually use a, a tool called the uh, Net Promoter Score for all of our programs. And we ask people if they would recommend the, the, the uh, initiative to someone else. Net Promoter Score is helpful because um, corporate America always uses it as a measure of whether or not their customers are satisfied with the car or the you know, movie theater or whatever they're using. And when we use it in social service environments or in advocacy environments, we're holding ourselves to a stand standard of, of building trust and building a positive relationship with our, with our customers and the people that we work with. And then the other side of the equation is communications. Once we've got that trust and once we know that we're making a difference and that we have a high score and that we've learned a lot about what people want in that very direct and very immediate way, we can then leverage that trust in our relationships with government entities, with corporate supporters and say, listen, you might be a company that has a net promoter score of 40, but we have a net promoter score of 90. So why don't you work with us? We can help people try certain things that are likely to make it more trustworthy for you. So a very simple example, um, Wired Magazine is a obviously major outlet for, for, for media. And they called me a bunch of years ago and they said, you know, we're doing this article about Comcast with their Internet Essentials program. And we don't really trust Comcast very much to be doing the right thing. And we wanted to get a snarky comment from you about, you know, how they're kind of, you know, just doing window dressing here. And I was working with that program at the time. And I know that Comcast has issues with customers in, in a lot of environments and they're not the most beloved company as many, many cable companies have this problem, but that program mattered. It really mattered. And so I said, listen, no, 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 no. We've been working with actual seniors in five cities that are using internet essentials and it's working for them. It's not perfect, it needs improvement, but this is not the time to come in and, and beat up on them about something when they're doing the right thing and they're actually working with organizations in communities, in neighborhoods that need it. And you're gonna come in and start throwing you know, like bombs at them. Let's try to work with them a little bit more. And so being able to bridge the community level needs that people have and a meaningful program that's done well with the, the various entities that are trying to find ways into the systems that we have puts us in the driver's seat. And as long as we're managing those communications and data points and we're staying focused on our mission and authentic to the actual outcomes we're trying to achieve, I think it really builds a, a better system for everybody. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Tom. Tom Camber of Oats, thank you so much for uh, your keynote today. We learned a lot, we're inspired. Uh, Gina Beck, thank you so much for participating today. Before we go, I wanna introduce one of my colleagues, Jen Rivera, 
who is ASA's membership engagement manager. Jen, take it away. Yes, it has been so much fun hearing how everyone is working to tackle the digital divide. I've learned so much and I hope you have as well. The energy from this forum was amazing and we hope you continue these conversations through ASA collaboratives. We would love for everyone to share via social media how you're committed to tackling the digital divide. Posting your commitment via social media is going to do one of two things, provoke thought and also remind peers that we still have work to do on this topic. We've created a printable document and social media graphic you can use to accomplish this ask. It's not enough to attend this forum and go back to our usual routines. We have to continue working together. Uh, Delilah Wilson-Scott with Comcast said something that really stuck with me. She said, we learn better together. Please do not forget that as we continue to tackle the digital divide. Thank you, Jen, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I invite all of you to become ASA members and uh, pay attention to your email that you received uh, this morning because there's a special discount offer for becoming a member if you're not already, but also uh, even more importantly, join us uh, at On Aging 2021 which will happen in April. It'll be a virtual experience. We hope you participate. If you like this sort of content, imagine this on steroids. It's gonna be a fantastic session of a series of sessions. We're also gonna continue our Generations Forum model uh, in July and then another one in September of 2021. There's additional information on our website right now. I would encourage you to sign up if you haven't already. And finally, I just wanna thank uh, the entire ASA staff for putting on a fantastic Generations Forum. It's the first one we've ever done, and I hope you agree. It was a wonderful, wonderful uh, forum. Thank you to all ASA staff. Uh, I also wanna thank the Program Advisory Committee, Gina Beck, Tom Camber, David Lindemann, Phil Stafford, Mark Alessi, Lois Drapin, Sumit Nagpal, Steve Ewell, Scott Pfeiffer, and Sherry Rose. Thank you all of you for joining us and uh, stay tuned for some more uh, ASA uh, programming and work in the future. Happy holidays, everyone.